As I was waiting those long preparatory hours before this final TEDx show, I couldn't find my earphones. What a big problem, don't you think so? Well, for me it is, because I badly needed to relax, but can't without listening to music. Anyways, I'm sure all of you must be having some problem of your own. For some of you, the uncertain future of democracy might be a big problem. To others, large-scale civil conflicts and wars might be a worrisome problem. And to some, the migration crisis. Go to an intellectuals party and you'll hear about problems like threats from gene editing and cloning, or about the biosecurity problem. Listen to the news and you'll soon find that the flood of fake information or the nuclear security problem are the real challenges. Yes, all these problems need solutions, real and serious solutions. But all this needs time and guess what? We don't have it. We really don't have time. We probably won't even have time to solve any of these problems unless we solve the biggest problem at our doorsteps right now. And that is climate change, global warming, melting ice caps, increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Ah, oh, I know, I know. Most of you are probably thinking, oh, come on, not again, give us a break. Trust me, I would have if the world talked more about the solutions rather than the problem, if the Paris Convention claims would have been practicable, if there were genuine signs of progress so as to make the COP21-2030 dreams realizable, if the 2030 targets made the 2050 ones look plausible, if a negotiated rise of two degrees in the average global temperature would have been sufficient, it is not only I who is saying this, but also the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers Survey. Consistently for the last three years, it has been putting this problem at the top of the list. Why should you listen to the Global Shapers? Because they are the world's under 30s with a different perspective. And as of 2017, more than 50% of the world population is under the age of 30. I'm sure you realize who they are. They are your children, maybe some of your grandchildren. Yes, that's us, the young generation, and it's high time that we exert this powerful voice of ours and raise alerts. The threat is greater than what we have been gearing for. Changes have started, but there is a need to do much more and immediately. It's now or never. For the ones that are still not convinced, a quick data anal analysis might help. Just have a look at the targets of these different nations and compare them to where their present status lies. The blue line represents the pledge, and the white line represents the target, uh, the trend. Japan, Canada, Australia, and finally, USA. The picture is not very encouraging, right? The targets are much more than what seems practicable considering the present status. It feels good when the different nations of the world join hands to find solutions to a common problem. But if you really look at the commitments they make, they are nowhere close to the reductions required to prevent a two degree rise. I mean, they won't even be a third of what is required. Moreover, if the countries have to make their 2050 targets true, they have to set larger targets for 2030 as well and not leave the major part of the job for the later years. Added to this, American politicians couldn't even agree on whether climate change was real or not, much less on how to combat it. This paves the path for other countries who might say, well, why should we make the sacrifices and changes when we are only but a small part of it? This would start the never-ending struggle of who's first. But the unfortunate truth is that carbon is no local or national deterrent. Once produced, it is transmitted to the global atmosphere within days. So the problem is much greater than who's first. What is required is an international mindedness. Every single year, we're emitting more greenhouse gases than the previous one. And unless we do something about it, it's going to continue this way. So isn't there a solution then? The answer is, there is. There is still hope and there are solutions to even the biggest problem the world is facing today. Let me tell you a story from an interview in the Atlantic magazine. Once in 2015, in his office overlooking Lake Washington, Bill Gates grabbed a writing pad and scribbled arrows by the margins, both pointing inwards. He said the left arrow represented the, how the governments worldwide could dramatically increase spending on research and development, and the right arrow represented the carbon tax. The left arrow was the push, and the right arrow was the pull. In between the arrows, he sketched boxes to represent areas for deployment of new technologies and emphasized the scope for private investors. Now, what I particularly like about this man is that he doesn't only talk. 
So when the whole world was at crossroads thinking we need an energy innovation that provides us with energy that is one, cheaper than today's hydrocarbon energy, two, produces zero greenhouse gas emissions, and three, which is also as reliable as today's energy systems, Bill Gates was already working at the solution. He said when you put all those requirements together, what you need is an energy miracle. So how do you get this energy miracle? Well, Bill Gates along with some of the richest people in the world have launched a fund to invest in solutions driven by technology. This will bring together governments, research institutions, and private investors who will work together to counter climate change. He alone has invested $2 billion and launched what is known as TerraPower today. It is what the future might call an energy miracle. TerraPower found that more than 90% of the uranium mined was never used in a reactor. They are using this precious resource as a fuel for their reactors. They also spotted some huge reserves of palatal uranium in the US, which could provide for the American energy needs for the next 750 years. Don't believe it? Well, have it from the horse's mouth. Bill Gates and his colleagues looked at solar, wind, every kind of energy you can think of, and determined that they're all important, they all have their role. However, nuclear was the only source of energy which could provide the necessary huge quantities that we need on a global basis. Model of the traveling wave reactor. Uh, it is different than other reactors because it can use the type of uranium that today is just thrown out as its fuel. Well, traditional nuclear power, for every 100 pounds of uranium we mine, 90 something of it does not ever see a reactor. And so what an unfortunate waste. We're able to use that uranium waste that heretofore has been useless as the basic fuel for this reactor. And in fact, we spotted some fields of uranium in the United States that are this type that's thrown out. It's called depleted uranium. And there's enough of that to power the United States fleet for 750 years. It is even more fantastic because they claim to do away with not only the threat of bomb creation, but also managed to make the plant safe enough to prevent another Fukushima nuclear disaster. I bet if you need an energy miracle, you have to walk an extra technological mile. And some have already started. General Fusion, a Canadian company, is progressing to be the world's first commercially viable nuclear fusion power plant. Nuclear fusion is now safe with zero possibility of a meltdown scenario, requires less land area than other renewable energy setups, produces zero greenhouse gas emissions, only helium as exhaust, and can provide the world with energy for hundreds of millions of years. Transport constitutes 23% of energy-related emissions, and in this context, electric cars are undoubtedly a welcome solution. But to use these cars at a wide scale, we need more efficient batteries and battery charging systems. Researchers at the University of Sussex have claimed to discover a supercapacitor, which is 10,000 times more powerful than today's batteries. So much so that it can recharge a car in just the time needed to refuel a tank, and it won't need to be recharged for the next six to eight hours. Wow, I can't wait for that capacitor to hit the market. Anyways, did you know that about one-fourth of the world's emissions come from feeding this world of seven billion people? And most of that comes from the consumption of meat. One alternative could be to use lab-grown meat substitutes which look, feel, and taste like the real thing. It might seem like science fiction, but companies and investors are taking this really seriously. Beyond Meat is the world's first company to have created an entirely plant-based meat burger. I found a red salami at Riri the other day, and it tasted really good. Ever heard of What the Pita, an all-vegan kebab shop? Well, try it for the sake of our climate. But I think the ultimate solution to climate change is what the Canadian startup Carbon Engineering is working on taking carbon dioxide directly from the air and making fuel out of it. We're getting energy by using up the minus itself. Isn't it simply fantastic? More so because according to carbon engineering, direct air capture removes far more CO2 per unit of land than trees or plants. Friends, believe it or not, there are hundreds of such ventures around the world which can work wonders. Sidewalk Labs, a part of Alphabet Inc., the parent of Google, is harnessing digital technologies to solve today's pressing urban problems. How is that related to climate change? Let me explain. In one of their recent projects, they are trying to find hotspots of traffic congestion in today's modern cities 
and finding ways on how to prevent or divert them. This can save a huge amount of CO2 emissions every year. Impressed? Then what would you say about this? Mazdar City, the ultimate solution city of our future. On February the 8th, 2008, the government of Abu Dhabi launched an ambitious plan to create what aims to be the world's sustainable city, Mazda City. This is viewed by many as one of the world's most exciting developments. 17 kilometers southeast from the center of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, a vision for all future cities is taking shape. Mazda City aims to be zero waste, zero carbon, and a fossil fuel free city. Many such endeavors are being made around the world by innovative giants as well as creative nobodies. In USA, North Energy Innovations is harnessing tidal energy from waves in their test device Azura. Meanwhile, in Scotland, floating wind turbines are expected to provide electricity to over 20,000 homes and efforts are being made to convert the 5,500 degrees of heat at the Earth's core into electricity using geothermal power plants. Yes, there are hundreds of such startups like Solar Roadways, which is using solar panels on roadways to harness solar energy, or Sky Mines, which is clearing industrial smog by making baking soda out of it, or New Light Technologies, which is collecting methane, which, by the way, is more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon, and using it to make plastic used in chairs or smartphone cases. Amazing, aren't they? Often these technologies seem too good to be real, but they are the fast-forming realities. Another thing to note in this regard is that this revolutionary energy miracle we are looking for might seem like a mega project and in totality it is, but there is also a need to diversify. There is no one solution to such a huge problem, there normally isn't, and therefore Wherever, whoever is willing to make a change needs to be encouraged and funded. And as Bill Gates rightly said, if you go back to Edison's time, there wasn't a lot of government funding. There were private investors funding him. Well, Bill Gates has given his two billion and is continuously lending his more expensive asset, his brains. Members of the Breakthrough Energy Coalition and amongst its members, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, Jack Ma from the Alibaba Group and Richard Branson have committed to investing in billions over the next 20 years in solutions driven by technology. But, we are in Jeff Bezos or Jack Ma. What can we do? The answer is, we can still do a lot. We can suggest innovative ideas. We can research our own solutions. We can implement our solutions in small-scale pilot projects. We can talk to our employer companies about partnering with one of these fantastic ideas discussed today. And of course, if not in millions, we can all contribute with our own little share. Because we are the majority, and this is a mammoth problem. Please do not let this die down as just another TEDx talk. I'm sure all of us will think of and contribute in our own little ways. Thank you for listening, and thanks in advance for helping save the world.